So indeed, uh, my name is uh, Thierry Jamarty and I'm from the University of Geneva. So we continue with the Swiss uh, session this morning. Uh, now I'm sure many of you know the University of Geneva for my colleagues, Tas Mianov and Hugo Dominique Coppa. Uh, I'm in the physics department, not in the math department. So you might wonder what a physicist is doing in uh, this nice conference. And uh, I must admit that sometimes I'm wondering also, uh, <laughs> but I first would like to thank very warmly Frank, the organizing committee, the scientific committee for having invited me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, the reason is of course uh, the same reason than uh, all of us, uh, Frank, uh, I must say that uh, I, I have to correct uh, the first speaker of the conference. He was not the one who knew Frank from the longest period of time. I'm probably having this honor because we met first in 1980 uh, during the preparatory school. We were not in the same class, but in the same uh, cours de récréation. We were neighbors, essentially. And uh, then we... we uh, met again uh, because both of us, uh, Frank in mathematics and myself in physics, uh, went to the Ecole Normale in Paris, uh, where we take also some course together in table soccer. And Francois Gols, who is here, can testify that we were very, very uh, good students in this, uh, in this field. So it's, it's a real pleasure, of course, to be there for uh, this conference in, in honor of Frank. Frank, I have to show you two photographs. Uh, well, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> they have not been generated by deep fake. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just uh, as a puzzle for you, uh, okay, here is Frank. Uh, and the second photograph, uh, you notice the, this very, very nice costume. So Frank, as a puzzle for you during the talk, you have to find where, where and <laughs> when these two photographs were taken. This one is easy. Yeah, this one is more easy. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll whisper the answer in your ear at the end of the talk. And of course, uh, uh, happy birthday, even if we celebrated the birthday a little bit before the conference, and of course, many, many happy returns. Now, of course, the first uh, moment of pleasure passed for a physicist to be in a mathematician conference. Uh, you can imagine the sheer terror. Uh, what am I going to tell? Uh, because Frank is a specialist of blow up in particular, it's not at all close to my own research. And so I have to find a quote, nice story uh, to tell you. And that's what I will try to do. Uh, but of course, I will tell it uh, from the point of view of a physicist, uh, which means that first we have a problem which is the same then for those who saw the movie here, uh, communication. We don't have the same language. Uh, so please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Don't hesitate to ask any question during the talk. Don't wait till the end of the talk, because if I am saying things that you don't understand, uh, just stop me. It doesn't matter how far I'm going in my story. Uh, let me tell you a part of it, but uh, hopefully a part that you can enjoy and that you can understand. I'm also realizing that I'm the only thing standing between you and a lunch, so I'll try to <laughs> stay. Uh, I'll try to stay uh, on time. So what I'm going to tell you is uh, uh, I needed to find a wave equation. And of course, for a physicist, Schrodinger's equation is uh, the equation. Uh, and I needed to put some nonlinear terms. And there are many ways one can put nonlinear terms uh, in physics. Uh, you will hear uh, other talks, I'm sure, on this uh, from Ginzburg Landau equations and so on. Uh, but I wanted to tell something on which uh, I have. Uh, at least uh, uh, some experience. And so I will put disorder in the Schrodinger equation. And what I will try to show you is that this is a very, very beautiful problem. Uh, a good part of this problem has been analyzed and beaten to death. Uh, but a part of it is very much alive. And I would say for this, uh, the physics community certainly needs the help of the mathematician community, uh, because there are some questions which are extremely tough for us. Uh, and I'll try to point out uh, these questions. So 
uh, let me uh, uh, first uh, mention why this order. Maybe I can push myself here. Uh, of course, you all know that if you take classical particles, this order is ubiquitous in nature. Right? It's very hard to avoid having some dirt in any piece of material that you look at. And we all know since uh, essentially uh, Einstein and Sutherland that if you have impurities, if you have dirt into uh, classical equations, it leads to diffusion. Instead of particle moving ballistically with a distance which is proportional to the time, they move with a, a sort of a mean distance which is only growing uh, as the square root of the time. And now one question you could wonder is, uh, we know that re in reality because of quantum mechanics particles are waves and uh, what does it change? Uh, and uh, this is uh, something which you could imagine saying uh, well, it changes a lot of things, I'll explain this line, because if I have an obstacle, classically I cannot pass the obstacle if my energy is less than the height of the potential, but if I am in quantum mechanics I can tunnel through the, uh, uh, through the obstacle. So you would imagine that in quantum mechanics, moving in a disordered environment is more easy than it is for classical particles. And the first answer that came in the mid-20th uh, century was very disappointing. It's not that it's more easy or more difficult or whatever, it doesn't change anything. If you compute the conductivity, which is the relation between the current and the force, if you want, the electric field, uh, you find the very classical answer uh, with the lifetime of the particle. Uh, this is the so-called Ruder formula. Uh, so it seems that the wave nature of uh, particles is not really important to compute uh, the uh, transport in a random environment. And I'm sure you all went through these uh, uh, very nice problems where you have uh, an electron which is considered as a little ball who bumps into an impurity, goes randomly in all directions, bumps into another impurity, and so on and so forth, and then you compute the uh, current. Actually, uh, this is not completely true. So rather than write on the board, I wouldn't dare to do that, you know, it's too nice a board. So I wrote on my tablet and I took, uh, I took a copy of this. So it's a compromise. So be gentle with me. Again, don't hesitate to ask any question if something I'm saying is not uh, clear. So uh, we have the Schrodinger equation. So again, I have my system which is described by an Hamiltonian. I have my uh, eigenstates here. Uh, so I have to obey the Schrodinger equation which I've written here using the so-called Dirac notation. H psi is equal to the eigenenergy times psi. And the typical Hamiltonian for one particle is p squared over 2m, the momentum of the particle. And then I can put a a, a, a local potential which is dependent on, on space. For the moment, let me just ignore this. This I set this to zero. And of course, if I just have momenta, this is trivial to diagonalize. And we know the eigenstates and the eigenvalues. The eigenstates are just plane waves. Uh, essentially, the particle is everywhere uh, with an homogeneous uh, density uh, in the system. Now we know already that there are very interesting effects. Uh, most of the time I'll be in one dimension, both because it's easier to draw, but also because most of what I will tell you is particularly important in one dimension. If I move to other dimensions, I will explicitly mention it. If you have any doubts, again, don't hesitate to, to ask. Uh, we know that potentials here, when we add them to this equation, change drastically the physics. And this is obvious if you put a periodic potential, this is something which is very easy to solve. And what happened is that every time you get one period of the potential, part of the wave which is going here is backscattered by the potential. And this creates interferences, which makes that not all the eigenenergies are possible, which was the case for the plane waves. The energies are k square over 2m, so if you change the momentum, you change the energy in a continuous way. But uh, if I have a periodic potential, there are some energies that are forbidden, completely forbidden, and this is what people call the energy bands in solids or the energy gaps in the spectrum. So we already see that there is something weird because this will happen 
even if the potential is very, very small here, and in particular much smaller than the kinetic energy of the particles. Of course, the gap itself shrinks as the potential is going to zero. And so the question is, what happens if now, instead of having a periodic potential, uh, we are having a, a disordered one? What happens if uh, I have something which is uh, random, and I'll try to explain what I mean by random in a moment. And again, there, there is something which is physically obvious. Imagine the potential is super high. It's the Mont Blanc. It's the, you know, uh, something uh, super huge. Well, I cannot go through the Mont Blanc, so I'll be localized. I cannot go through the potential. But on the other hand, if the energy of the particle of the eigenstates is supposed to be very high compared to the random potential, one would imagine that the particle will surf over the random potential. Even a classical particle should surf over the random potential. And so, more or less, give or take, we keep plane waves or we go to something which is diffusive or uh, something simple is, is happening. Okay, so let's see uh, whether this is true or uh, not true. Uh, first, let me, uh, because uh, again, uh, I have to be precise, so let me define what I call disorder. I remember a conference in Santa Barbara where I was writing grad U, and we spent half an hour decided, deciding with the audience what grad U meant. Uh, I swore I would never do the same mistake again, so okay, I'll try to explain what is the, the disorder. So. Uh, the, the, the best disorder probably is to say that you get impurities. So each impurity is a potential which is put at a random position. So you put a disorder where the strength of the potential is, let's say, the same, just for simplicity. And you have random positions for the uh, impurities. And you spread, you, you throw balls, let's say, on a 2D surface at random. This is what physicists call the Poissonian disorder. Uh, it has the advantage that you can control the amplitude very well uh, of this uh, disorder. Now, it's uh, not very convenient to work with this. So people have worked with other distributions. Uh, you take a V of R, which is a random variable drawn with a Gaussian distribution or a box distribution between a maximum and a minimum. So we've, we've, we've used uh, all of this disorder. Oops, sorry. Why did it go back? Uh, we'll use of, uh, all of these disorders. Of course, if I am in the continuum, I have to suitably regularize these distributions to avoid problem. Uh, let me just mention another point, which we will forget immediately, but I have to mention it. If you do an experiment, you have one realization of the disorder. You have your sample, and that's it. But it's big. So if it's big, you could say that this part sees a certain disorder, this part sees a certain disorder, and in a way, when you look at the whole sample, uh, again, uh, dimensions, uh, distance between atoms are very small, angstrom, uh, 10 to the minus 10. Uh, we are talking about samples which are centimeter long, let's say, 10 to the minus 2. So it makes a lot of atoms and a lot of impurities, and uh, we can consider that various parts of the system kind of provide for you the averaging of a disorder. So theorists like me prefer, of course, rather than dealing with one realization and a big sample, to do explicitly the averaging of a disorder. So you draw several realizations of the disorder with a certain probability distribution, and then you do the averaging. This is totally mandatory if you do numerical calculations, because there you don't have 10 to the 23 particle, but you have 100. And then uh, the fact that there are several realizations in several parts of the system is not so true anymore. Okay. I just want to uh, introduce to you, in case you don't know it, I'm sure many people in the audience know it, a discrete version of what I showed, so Schrodinger equation plus random potential. But let me discretize, in a way, the Schrodinger equation. This is what is known as the tight binding model. This is a model which is very well suited to describe solids, where you say that uh, you get a discrete set of states which let's say, symbolize a particle which is around an atom, a fixed atom. 
And then uh, you have a, a matrix element which can take the particle from this site and put it to the next site or the previous one. Uh, I should have written the should have written the other part, which I didn't. Uh, of course, this is a Schrodinger equation, so this has to be done uh, coherently. And uh, then uh, I can put on each one of these sites a random potential. So my Hamiltonian is very simple. It has random elements on the diagonal, which is my random potential, and it has uh, two elements away from the. Uh, uh, the main diagonal, which are just minus t. t is not the time, eh? here is the tunneling. Uh, minus t, which is fixed. And the problem consists in solving, diagonalizing this matrix. So today, it's trivial. On a computer, uh, you can easily do uh, uh, 10,000 by 10,000 matrix like this. Uh, and in a couple of microseconds, you get the eigenstates and you get the eigenvalues. But there was a time when it was not so easy. And this was in 1957, uh, because computers were not where they are, uh, where a, a physicist of the name of Phil Anderson, who is one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century in condensed matter, a Nobel Prize, of course, uh, discovered something which was totally unexpected, uh, which is that if you put even a very small amount of disorder on the diagonal, the eigenstates change completely. The eigenvalues, not so much. They, they, they sort of uh, go through practically the same, uh, let's say, set of numbers than the eigenvalues of the undisordered system. But the eigenstates are completely different. Instead of plane waves, which are everywhere, you get exponentially localized wave functions. This is, uh, so here is Phil Anderson. Uh, this is a phenomenon which is known as Anderson localization. And it's very interesting to read what Anderson himself said during his Nobel Prize lecture about the phenomenon. He says very few believe localization at the time, and even fewer so its importance. Among those who failed to fully understand it at first was certainly its author. It has yet to receive adequate mathematical treatment, still true. And one has to resort to the indignity of numerical simulations to settle uh, even the simplest question about it. Not true for one particle, because now, as I said, you can do it on a computer like this. But you will see, when one puts interactions, things become a little bit more fun. So I think the statement which was done in 77 for the adequate mathematical treatment is still true. Very precious few is known rigorously on this. And I will try to point out what I know is known. But again, don't hesitate to contradict me if you know uh, things which have been uh, discovered. Uh, here is just for, uh, I won't comment on this, uh, here is some references that you can uh, have fun reading if you want to know more. Uh, these ones are uh, uh, essentially physicist references. Uh, that uh, uh, were done for the 50 years of Anderson localization. This is a school in Boulder uh, on essentially Anderson localization. And there is here something which is maybe closer to your heart, which was a, a little uh, day organized by a Simon's collaboration on wave and disorder, uh, whose uh, PI is Svetla Svetlana uh, Maibodora. Uh, my yeah, my brother. Yeah, uh, and this was an interesting day uh, because the day was split in two. In the morning, there was a physicist who was supposed to explain to the mathematicians in the collaboration what Anderson localization was. I was the victim. And in the afternoon, there was a mathematician that was supposed to explain to the physicist of the collaboration what Anderson localization was. And this was a very, very nice day because, uh, OK, let's say I think each part uh, learned a lot. So uh, the videos are recorded. If you want to uh, see both the math and the physics aspect, uh, I, I recommend that you go to this, uh, to this one. OK, so uh, let me discuss a little bit the, the consequences of having disorder. And now I'll, I'll concentrate on the 1D solution. I'll come to a uh, higher dimension uh, later. Uh, 
question, what is the nature of the spectrum? What are the eigenvalues? Uh, what is the density of state, which is sort of the number of states which have an energy between E and E plus DE? Uh, okay. What is the level statistics? What is the correlation between having an eigenvalue at energy E and having an eigenvalue at energy E plus U? Is it changed compared to plane wave where it's stupidly uh, equally spaced? Uh, so these are legitimate questions and of course they can be answered numerically. You take again a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, you diagonalize it, very easy to do, you get your eigenstates and then you, you, you do this thing. Okay, there are some theorems on this, uh, but not much. What is the nature of the eigenstates? Uh, as I said, the big surprise was that even a sm an infinitesimal disorder, even a small disorder, was completely changing the nature of the eigenstates. And from plane wave, you were going to states which are exponentially localized with a characteristic length here, uh, which gives you the exponential decay, which people call the localization length, which is of course a function of the energy of the eigenstates. Uh, and what is remarkable in Wendy is that all eigenstates are localized. So you cannot find any single eigenstate which is uh, extended, uh, which has a uniform probability, not uniform, but uh, extended probability to exist everywhere. Uh, the fact that this is true for strong disorder has been proven mathematically, as far as I know. The fact that the uh, critical value in Wendy is zero. I don't think it has been proven, but I might be wrong on that one. And in two and three dimensions, only the strong disorder result is known. So this, there is room for improvement there. And I'll show you what happened in 2D and 3D. For physicists, uh, yep, sorry, there was a question. No, okay. For physicists, there is another quantity which is super important. Uh, after all, that was the one that was uh, uh, targeted initially, which is the transport. Imagine you have a piece of junk like this with impurities. You put contacts here, contact there, which means you put a force which will push the particles uh, going through the system. And you want to know what is the current which is going through the system in response to this force. Uh, this amounts in taking the uh, Schrodinger equation, let's say on the discrete system that I showed you, and put a linearly decreasing potential like this uh, from site 1 to site n. And this will induce a current that will pass through the system. And out of this, there are formulas uh, that allows you to compute the linear response to this potential, something called the Kubo formula. Uh, I'll show it a little bit later in the talk. And of course, one quantity you can extract is the so-called conductivity, which relates the current in the system with the force or the electric field that has been exerted. And of course, what you want to know is what is the conductivity of the system as a function, for example, of its size. Uh, and if it's localized, you would expect that it exponentially decreases with the size. That's one uh, question. Yep. No? OK. There are many questions, of course, that uh, people were asking. I'll, I'll show you that even very famous people can, can say wrong things. But OK, it was still 1968. So this is someone named Sir Neville Mott, who is, uh, again, one of the greatest condensed matter uh, theorists of the 20th century. Uh, he invented the uh, metal insulator transition of his own, which is called the Mott transition. But here he's discussing about Anderson localization. And he says, uh, OK, uh, let's see uh, the metal, non-metal transition. So the first question is, is there a transition? If you change the strength of disorder, will you go from a situation where you get plane waves, essentially, and the system is delocalized to a situation where everybody will be localized. In 1D, the answer is no. Everything is localized, but maybe in 2D or maybe in 3D. OK, so what Mott was saying is uh, the transition is first order, meaning there is a jump. Chalk. Uh, if the disorder is weak, I have a good conductivity, and suddenly I pass a critical value of the disorder, and boom, 
it jumps to zero, and then it's zero. It's wrong. We know now that it's wrong, uh, but in 68, that sounded like a, like a good idea. OK, I'll, I'll skip point B and C, which are more interesting for physicists. But I just want to point out the question, which is, is there a metal insulator, he calls it non-metal, but let's call it insulator, uh, transition as a function of the strength of the disorder? As I said, in 2D and 3D, I don't think this question has been answered mathematically. I mean, physicists have their own answer. I will show you the answer, but uh, I don't think this question has been answered uh, in, a, in, a, in a proof. So the answer to this question has been given by various peoples, and this is, goes under the name scaling theory, which I will not explain at all. But uh, maybe I should go to the other side. I'm blocking your, your view. Of, uh, OK. So. Um, it goes under the name of scaling theory, and it's based on the work of this gentleman, David Thaules, who got the Nobel Prize in physics for other works. There is something called the berzinski kostalis thaules uh, transition. But he did absolutely seminal work on the field of Anderson localization. And the thing he invented was reused by a uh, gang of four, it's the official name, the gang of four, uh, which is uh, Elio Abrahams, uh, P.W. Anderson, Lichard Delo, and Ramakrishnan. Here is the photo of this uh, uh, um, uh, gentleman. I'm sorry, I don't have a photo of Lichard Delo. It seems that he disappeared in the continuum. Uh, and they, they, they sort of uh, went trying to build a very simple theory of what is the conductivity, or rather the so-called conductance, which is the total uh, transport of a piece of metal of size L. And I won't go into detail of how to do it. If you ask me, I I'll, I'll can explain. It's something that can be explained in, in five minutes. What they found is that if you're below the equal to, essentially, there is no value of the disorder. So let's say this is the conductance itself. So if you want, this is a kind of measure of the how good metal or insulator the system is. So in a way, it's a measure of the strength of the disorder. So if you're below the equal to, there is no value of the disorder, which can give you a, 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 a finite uh, conductance. So the, the system just always plunges to uh, insulator. If you're in D equal to, it's marginal, but it's based on this theory it seems that it's always the same fate. So in D equal to, there is also not a, 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 a localization, delocalization transition. Uh, but uh, the states are much less localized than they are in 1D. In 1D, if you want, uh, if you take, let's say, the, the mean free path, the distance between impurities, if you want, the localization length is about the mean free path. Uh, said brutally, you, you have a particle moving, it bumps on an impurity, goes back, bumps onto another impurity, goes back, and that's it. It's localized. Twice or whatever. Uh, in uh, two dimensions, this length here is exponentially large in the mean free path, which means you can easily reach the Earth-Moon distance. Uh, so you can call it localized, but that's uh, a, a view of... Uh, uh, let's say it's, it's in an idealized theoretical world. But nevertheless, the claim is that there is no transition in two dimensions. And in three dimensions, there is a transition. So if the disorder is smaller than a certain quantity, then the system is metallic. It has a finite uh, transport. And if the uh, disorder is larger than a certain quantity, which people call the mobility edge, if you want, uh, then the system is insulated. Again, to the best of my knowledge, this is consequences of this theory and, of course, the many sophisticated improvements that have been made on the top of this and the many numerical simulations that have been made on the top of this. But there is no uh, uh, mathematical proof, to the best of my knowledge, of this. And there is no mathematical analysis of what happens close to the transition, because you can imagine that the wave functions, the eigenstates, will be very weird at this critical point. Uh, for example, uh, uh, 
uh, here is a, a, a numerical solution of the wave function at uh, uh, the critical point by Sasha Merlin at Karlsruhe. And uh, it seems the wave function shows a multifractal structure. Uh, again, these are essentially numerical evidence, uh, very hard to do a theory. Uh, there are theories which have been done uh, in physics, but they are uh, extremely uh, difficult to do. Just to show you that this is reality, it exists, I cannot resist showing you an experiment, you know. Uh, this was done in cold atomic gases, so there are gases which have been trapped by using lasers. I'm sure all of you know this gentleman because he got the Nobel Prize uh, uh, this year, it's Alain Aspe. And this is uh, Massimo Inguccio, uh, I would say uh, uh, his, his homologue in, uh, in uh, Florence, in Italy. And both of them studied using these gases, uh, the localization due to disorder by slightly different tricks. So here is the image, this is not a drawing from, uh, uh, this is the image of the wave functions uh, of a particle uh, in the random potential which has been created by light. And you see here uh, the exponential tails that correspond to the wave function uh, decay uh, in the system. Uh, Massimo Inguccio doesn't use a random potential but use what people call quasi-periodics which is a sum of two cosines with incommensurate wave vectors. And what you see is that it produces essentially the same effect, which is an exponential localization of the uh, wave function. Uh, this class of potential has been less studied. It has been studied a lot by um, uh, Serge Aubry. Uh, it's called the Aubry-André model. Uh, and there are a certain number of things that can be proved relatively rigorously, but I would say it's also something for which uh, uh, we certainly lack uh, information. Okay, now let me move to what I would say uh, is probably the heart of the matter at the moment in the physics community, which is the case of interacting particles. Uh, as I said, the case of non-interacting particle, it's difficult, it needs to be proven. There are a lot of very fine quantities like the structure of the wave function at the transition and so on that, you know, we don't know. But essentially, you take a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, you diagonalize it on a computer, you can get a lot of information. But all this finishes as soon as you put more than one particle and you have interactions between them. Okay, so that's what I would like to describe. And that becomes more difficult for those who have seen the movie. Uh, okay, so let me show you two models which physicists love to, uh, love to, uh, to deal with. One is the so-called gross pitayevsky model, the other is the Lieb-Linninger uh, model. I remember a conversation with Frank, we were discussing mathematical physicists, and I was telling Frank, oh, there is this guy you might know as a mathematical physicist, uh, he's really great, he did a lot of things, uh, he's Eliot Lieb. And Frank looked at me, Eliot Lieb? What do you mean? Eliot Lieb is a mathematician. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a good sign when two communities want to get you, I would say. So, okay. So the other is the so-called Lieb-Leninger model that I will try to, to explain. Okay. So this model, which was introduced by Pitayevsky uh, here, uh, is essentially a, a, a sort of a very equivalent for those of you who know of the Ginzburg-Landau uh, model. And this is a model which is supposed to describe a bunch of bosons, many, many bosons who interact and have a Bose-Einstein condensation. So they are in a coherent state, they are in a superfluid state, and this superfluid state is described by this wave function psi, uh, which is the wave function, which is a collective wave function, which depends on the co spatial coordinates, so three uh, coordinates if you're in 3D and eventually the time if you want uh, and you get uh, essentially the equivalent of a non-linear so you get the linear term here in the Hamiltonian which when you write the equation is very much like the Schrodinger equation but then you get this non-linear term which is describing the fact that the particle interact and uh, of course uh, it gives you a cubic term in the equation here. 
Now, without the randomness, this is a, a model that has been intensively studied. With the randomness, this becomes a very nasty model. And we know, again, mostly numerical things about it. And I'm sure there are a certain number of things that one could uh, tackle by methods which are not the usual methods of, uh, of a physicist. A variant on this model is the so-called Lieblinger model. It's the same idea. You want to describe n bosons. And now, of course, your wave function has to contain n coordinates. I'm in 1D. So I have a wave function, which is the wave function describing my n bosons, with x1 the coordinate of one of the bosons, x2 the coordinate of another one, x3, and so on. Uh, if you wonder why I'm not saying x1 is the coordinate of the first boson, the x2 the second, and whatever, is because bosons are indiscernible particles. So the wave function has to be totally invariant by permutation two by two of each pair of particles. So you don't really know which boson is which, uh, and that's a constraint you have to implement on the wave function. And then the Hamiltonian is what you would naively expect, the kinetic energy. This is the p square over 2m. That's just the derivative with respect to the coordinate of each one of the particles. But then there is an interaction which tells you that you have an extra energy cost, c or 2c, uh, when two particles are at the same point in space. So these are two particles which really, when they are on the top of each other, you pay a penalty. Uh, the penalty is not necessarily infinite, huh? it's a finite energy cost. So this is a nasty model by itself, and it was solved by Lieb and Lininger using a technique which is known as better on that, uh, which consists in writing essentially explicitly the wave function. Uh, but which is, uh, uh, let's say, it's okay to write explicitly the wave function. It's much more difficult to extract physical observables out of this study. And it's, uh, the technique was invented by Hans Better in 1934, if I remember correctly. And it's only at the beginning of the 21st century that people could compute the first physical uh, correlation functions out of the better on that. Uh, very often, when people tell you a model is exactly solvable by better on that, the only thing that they know is that it's solvable. They don't know anything else but the solution. Ah, because if you put Coulomb, it's not solvable by better on that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you could put Coulomb, you could put 1 over r square. So 1 over r square is also solvable. It was solved by Haldane and Shastri. Uh, or any other potential is possible. I could put a v of x1 minus x2. And of course, there are approximate techniques, uh, field theory, bosonization, and so on, where you can deal with these potentials. But if you want to use the exact solution, you have to uh, have a delta function potential. So, of course, you're, you're totally correct. Uh, I must say, if I take the cold atoms that I showed you before, cold atoms are neutral, so they don't see each other very far. And the delta function is actually a pretty good approximation. So it's not, this is, this is a model that is realized experimentally, actually, although it would seem like a kind of crazy model, but it's, it's a very experimentally relevant model now. Not, not in condensed matter, but in cold atomic systems. OK. If you put the disorder on the top of it, uh, OK. Again, something extremely difficult. Uh, let me give you a discrete version again, as I, as I uh, was doing for the uh, uh, simple uh, transport. And that's something called the XXZ spin chain. Uh, I, I choose this one because it's easy to visualize. You say on each side, I have. Uh, a system which is, uh, can be in two states, either, let's say, down or up. And therefore, on each side, I have a, 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 a Hilbert space, which is described by the Pauli matrices, if you want, a two by two matrix. And my energy is essentially what you would expect for a magnetic interaction. So it's Sx, Sx plus Sy, Sy. OK, here I've put a different coefficient for Sz, Sz. And then you put on each side 
a random magnetic field which favors either spin up or spin down on each side. Why I'm saying that this system is very much like the ones before, if you think in your head that the spin down is like not putting a particle on the side and the spin up is like putting a particle, when you do something like this, you have the particle jumping to the next side. And uh, when there are two particles which are nearby, up and up, they don't have the same interaction because of this term than if you have one particle and a hole here on this side. And so this is very much like the Lieb-Linear model plus disorder, except it's on a discrete, uh, it's on a discrete lattice. OK, what are the questions? We want to work uh, just uh, a remark. The Hilbert space now is 2 to the n which means you can do 40 sites on the best computers. Compute 2 to the power 40, and then you say I have a matrix 2 to the power 40 times 2 to the power 40, and you will see. This blows up your computer. And if you add one site, you double the Hilbert space, which means even if your computer can do it, uh, the best you can do is add one site, not double the size of the system, just add one site. So brute force calculation, you're dead if you want to deal with this kind of technique. And that's the kind of thing that we need to solve to describe experiments. So what are the questions? Same questions if there is no temperature. So if we do quantum mechanics, what is the ground state? What is the nature of the ground state? Localized, not localized? What are the physical observables? Uh, and essentially what you would like to know is do the interaction help the localization or do they kill it? After all, I tell you bosons are superfluid. A superfluid is something that can flow without being blocked by dirt. So you would imagine if I put a little bit of disorder on the top of a superfluid, it shouldn't be localized. It should zzz, zoom through the disorder. On the other hand, if I have a lot of disorder, I shouldn't have the superfluidity. So one immediately realized that there must be a competition between disorder and interactions, which will change the, the deal compared to the non-interacting system. So that's the kind of question that one wants to know. And since, unfortunately, experiments are done usually at finite temperature, we cannot just compute things in average in the ground state but we have to compute the usual Boltzmann trace uh, where we have to average over all the states with a distribution which is given by exponential of minus beta h where beta is the inverse temperature, which makes the calculation, of course, even more complicated. Okay. Uh, maybe I will skip this, but just to show you that actually using dirty technique, one can uh, essentially uh, predict transition between a superfluid state and a localized state, which people call the Bose glass. Uh, and this is confirmed by some numerical calculations. Let me go very fast there. Uh, some numerical calculation. Here is, a, is, a, is a, a phase diagram that was obtained by people in Munich, uh, uh, where you see very clearly, but look, this is numerics. Uh, the transition between superfluid and the Bose glass. Uh, just to show you, uh, look, these are numerical works which span 1990 to 2009, and it continues, of course, today. So again, it would be nice to have definite answers on this type of issues, uh, because uh, uh, there are a lot of questions. Let me maybe skip the quasi-periodic, because I would like to keep a little bit of time uh, for questions. Uh, just to show you, people can realize this in experiment. Uh, here is uh, very similar experiments than the one I showed you before. They, they are done in the group of uh, uh, Massimo Inguccio in, in Florence. Uh, this is again uh, putting two lasers with two different uh, wave vectors, cosine Q1x plus cosine Q2x. Uh, here is what they measure. Uh, just without going into details. This quantity here tells you how good or bad the superfluid 
the system is. When this is blue, it's a good superfluid. When it's red, it's a bad superfluid. Now, you, you're wondering what a good and a bad superfluid is. I, uh, if, ask me the question if you really want to know, but I won't go in detail. But you see here that there is a region where you would say it's superfluid, and there is here another region where you would say it's not superfluid. So this goes well with the idea of having a phase transition between a localized and, and a superfluid system. One question for you, on which the physics community cannot decide, and maybe where the math community could answer. What is the transport? So what is the conductivity, and I'll explain what is the conductivity, as a function of the temperature of the problem? And there are two sort of schools. One is to say, OK, if I am at t equals 0, I'm localized. So let's say I'm in 1D, I'm lo totally localized. So my conductivity is 0. When I put a small temperature, I can jump from one localized state to the other. And if I put an electric field, particle will drift from one place to the next. So I have a very small conductivity here, which is uh, one formula that has been put forward is exponential of minus 1 over the temperature to some power. Uh, it has been invented by Mott. It's known as Mott variable range hopping. Uh, I won't go how this is derived, but this is a, a very plausible argument where particles jump from one exponentially localized state to the next. And then more recently, there was a series of papers. The, the first paper was a paper by a liner at Schuller Basco which were saying, no, this is only true if the system can exchange energy with the outside world. But if the system is totally isolated, actually the conductivity will stay zero up to a critical temperature. Zero, zero, zero. And it's only at a finite temperature that the system can start moving. And of course, uh, if you want to distinguish between these two situations, uh, numerically, it's a nightmare because zero is zero here, but here it's exponentially small. So before you see that in numerics and you distinguish in numerics, so, uh, that's uh, very difficult. So maybe a bound uh, could answer this question. Uh, so I'm putting this uh, forward uh, in front of you as uh, maybe a challenge. Take it as a challenge. The conductivity is a very simple object. You have this current operator that I defined in, uh, in a previous slide, which is relatively simple. You make it evolve with time using the standard Heisenberg representation in quantum mechanics. Uh, this is not trivial to compute, but this is trivial to define. And then the conductivity is just the integral from time zero to time infinity, forget even the frequency because we want this at omega equals zero, of the commutator of j at time t and j at time zero computed in average uh, as I defined before with a trace of exponential of minus beta h. So this is a well-defined object, perfectly well-defined if uh, the Hamiltonian is, is known, and which is supposed to have one of these two behavior or a third one that nobody has guessed yet. Yes? Sorry. Uh, a couple of questions regarding yeah. the slide. So first of all, in what sense is the system isolated? Because there's a T there, so there's a thermal bath. So the system is definitely not isolated. That's actually a very good question. Uh, when you use this formula here, that is known as the Kubo formula, which was established to do linear response in a perturbation, what you do is the following. You have time here. You assume that at time minus infinity, your state is distributed with the distribution exponential of minus h at time minus infinity. But then the thermostat is removed. So each one of these states now evolves as it wants, but with the isolated system. And when you compute this commutator, and whatever, you compute it for a totally isolated system. It's just at time equal minus infinity that you decided that you had a thermal distribution of state. It's not the same thing than saying that during the whole time of evolution, your system is in contact with a big uh, outside world and is able to receive or give energy. And why it's not innocent is because if you try to do a move 
between two localized states which are not at the same energy, if you have such a thermostat, you can give the difference of energy to the, to the thermostat, and then the move can be accepted. Then another move will uh, take the energy or whatever. So in average, you don't exchange energy. But for each one of the moves, you can. If you are totally isolated, then this move is forbidden. It doesn't conserve energy. So by law of quantum mechanics, it's forbidden. And therefore, an isolated system has a much harder time jumping from one localized state to the next. Actually, for the non-interacting system, we know the answer. The conductivity is, is zero at any temperature. Because there is no way, all states are localized, and there is no way you can transport uh, current. If you want it to be non-zero, you need to put the bath. Uh, and the second question yeah. is regarding that Kubo formula. Yes. The bottom. So you say it's well defined. It's not clear that this limit, when omega goes to zero, is actually well defined. It's far from obvious. No, it's far from obvious. I agree. Uh, with disorder, uh, actually, I cheated a little bit, but I can give you the clean uh, formula because there is usually a little regulator which is written uh, here with an exponential of zero plus time t. But I, I totally agree with you. It's not obvious that this limit is well defined. There are systems for which there could be a delta function at omega equals zero, but usually with disorder, the limit omega tending to zero is reasonably well defined. You have to take the limit of the number of particles going to infinity first. That's, there is a very well defined order of limit that you should respect. First, the size of the system and the number of particles go to infinity. And then you're allowed to take the limit omega goes to zero. Otherwise, you get discrete levels. And then again, you're, you're sensitive to the distance between eigenstates. Absolutely. But in the localized state, this is OK. Because in the localized state, the conductivity is supposed to go to 0. So sigma of omega and let's say t equals 0 is doing something like this, where this is going to 0. What you say is totally correct. In a superconductor, what you will get is a delta function here. And then you get a regular part. It doesn't matter what it is. But this, is, this delta function means you have a superconductor. Uh, if you have dirt, uh, let's say normally you should avoid that if you're in the localized phase. So your, your, your point is well taken, and, and it's totally correct. We know system for which there is a delta function here. But this is usually in the superconducting phase or in the superfluid phase that I was mentioning for the bosons, but not on the localized side. Yeah, but that's why I put it that way, because I think that's where we can discuss and try to formulate it as cleanly as possible, so that then a mathematician can work on it. Because for physicists, we are used to hop only. <laughs> uh, uh, OK. And now, you, as you put it on the board, it's almost formulated. I, I think it's close to being foolproof. But uh, uh, I totally agree with the points that are made. And so one has to be very careful in the, the there are questions which are hidden in this Kubo formula that physicists have lived with for the last, uh, whatever, 1950s or so, uh, so uh, 70 years, and which we sort of swallow immediately without even worrying about it, uh, which need to be defined. And indeed, if I take a clean superconductor, the limit omega goes to zero as is more complicated than that. Yeah, point perfectly well taken. Are there other questions on this? Yes. yes. Would you have a, a physical explanation of what happens at T star? Because it's, uh, from a mathematical standpoint, it makes sense that uh, the function has no reason to be smooth at, uh, at T star. But from a physical standpoint, what is happening for that? All of a sudden, you get this rush. That's a very good question. Nobody knows. The, the calculation that is in this paper is a pair to Actually, it was already in the Anderson paper in 1958. Uh, 57. And the, the idea is the following, that if you have this problem of not conserving energy and you have no interaction, this is dead. You cannot do anything. But if you have interactions, you can redistribute 
the energy to other localized states because you interact with them. So the, the system could act as a bath for itself. And when you write a kind of mean field theory of this, you find the transition point. Uh, whether this exists or not, uh, we know mean field theory giving you transition for systems for which there is no transition. Take the one easing model, it has no phase transition, but you do mean field, you find one. So whether this point is correct or not, uh, whether it's an artifact of this way of doing things, nobody knows. And nobody has been really able to compute uh, uh, essentially what happens around this point. The only thing I can say is that the scale is matching the one that, for example, I derived with using dirty methods for which the disorder kind of blow up. So it's the scale at which the disorder effect become really strong. And that's the scale at which if you have a thermostat, you would, you would sort of start in the mod variable range hopping. But again, whether there is this transition or not, I think it's a, it's a genuinely open problem. So are there other questions on this? I have only one more slide, so don't hesitate to ask questions. OK, one last question. In the same set of questions, in the same way, then there is this question on transport at low temperature. You could sort of move to very high temperature. Say, I don't care about temperature. I just do an average over all the states. I, I go to infinite temperature. All states are equally probable, essentially. If I am localized, maybe I don't explore the whole Hilbert space. I am confined to a subset of the Hilbert space. And if the disorder is weak, clearly I can explore the whole Hilbert space. So maybe there is a, 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 an ergodicity transition that occurs as a function of the strength of the disorder uh, because I'm going from a system which is localized even at finite energy density or if you prefer infinite temperature uh, and a system which would be kind of delocalized. Uh, so this is a little bit the equivalent of this uh, transition point that I showed you for the low temperature phase. Uh, I won't go into details uh, in this. I just point a, a very nice review that exists in Review of Modern Physics that you can look at. And I just want to point out that uh, uh, there are clearly uh, attempts to break this problem coming from the math community. Here is a paper by Imbri where he uh, attacks this problem. To the best of my knowledge, this is not a proof. This is, I heard the, the, the qualification quasi-proof. Uh, I wouldn't dare tell you what is a proof or a quasi-proof, but just to show that there is uh, issues that one can uh, try to attack. Uh, and, and again, these are issues that are difficult to address by the standard tools that the physicists have at their disposal. OK, I think that's uh, uh, a good point to uh, conclude. Uh, I leave you with the conclusions. Essentially, what I tried to show you is that Anderson localization, uh, so Schrodinger equation plus uh, disorder is a fantastically rich phenomenon even today. It is still very rich for non-interacting particles. But of course, as soon as you put uh, interactions, uh, the Hilbert space just explodes. And this becomes a very difficult and open problem, but one which I think could still be reachable by uh, rigorous tools that are the tools of uh, mathematics. So I think it makes for a nice uh, maybe convergence point between the two communities. And on that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. And of course, wishes Frank again a happy birthday. <laughs> So there are all these results by uh, Erdős uh, and Yao about the, uh, the case with very weak potential. Yes. So that's the uh, Schrodinger equations, the evolution Schrodinger equation. And I think it shows that uh, you have diffusion for this very weak, in this very weak potential. You mean, you mean in 1D or in, in more than 1D? In more than 1D. OK, then at least in 3D, there should be the answer that I thought was not there, because that's my memory of what was said at this meeting that I, but, but maybe I, I yeah, don't know. There are different methods because they are not spectral methods, but okay. they are just like 
So then, so then it would be nice to see what is the result in 2D. Because, uh, because, uh, because in, in 3D, we, people expect a mobility edge, but not in 2D. So if the result gives a, a delocalized phase in, in 3D, that's perfect at weak disorder. But if you go to 2D, the same method should either fail or whatever and show absence of diffusion. And, so, and certainly in 1D. So in 3D, I'm, I'm not sure that you get the, the linearized Boltzmann equation, and then, and then for large time, you get the diffusion. OK, fine. In 2D, I don't remember, but I get OK, check. but it would be interesting to see, because then, then it answers the question that this side is uh, delocalized, localized in 2D, and localized in 1D. And I think that's and the Poisson case that you mentioned, so this difference. That, should, that shouldn't matter. I mean, if the disorder is weak, uh, Poissonian gives Gaussian uh, any time. So at least for physicists, it will not matter. I don't know for mathematicians, but for physicists, no, because you, you get a, a very large number of impurity per uh, sort of zone, which is concerned by the, by the system. And then you have central limit theorem, which reduces the disorder to a, to a Gaussian disorder, essentially. So I don't think it matters. Let me say it that way. I would be extremely surprised if there is an answer which is given for weak Poissonian disorder. Strong Poissonian disorder is a different story, because then you can be pinned by one very strong impurity and not collectively. But for weak Poissonian disorder, I don't think it matters. So if it's there for Poissonian, OK, we should, uh, or you should yeah, tell me what is the reference. Uh, just a main question. Uh, okay, uh, I, I see uh, you start. Uh, you, uh, that's a good picture. Nobody has tried large duration because it should be easier in some sense. Uh, that's uh, that's an uh, interesting question. So people have tried, of course. Uh, there is a paper by Efetov, uh, who is a, a very, very well-known uh, physicist. And in D equal infinity, he found very weird results. And uh, uh, people don't believe very much that these results were correct. But again, if you go too high in dimension, uh, the system will become a little bit trivial unless you manage to scale the strength of disorder. I, I, I was thinking at this point, as a point. Of yeah, yeah. So you have to find a way to scale up this point properly as you as you move up in dimension. Yeah, at least the only work I know moving up in dimension is this work by Efetov, where he, he, he found some weird results. He, he also went on to the Cayley tree. Uh, and, uh, but I would say here the excitement uh, also for physics reason is around D equal to. But uh, your point is well taken. I cannot give you other reference. I'm, I'm sure other people have tried to look at, but I cannot uh, comment on those. Yeah. That's a very good point. More questions? No more questions? We can. Lunch. <laughs>